This is creating a culture of documentation. Oh no, I did not want my text to do that. It's gonna do that the whole time, isn't it? Awesome, cool. All right, um, I'm Alana Burke. We're at Drupal Camp, New Jersey. Um, this is all my contact info. Um, I am the community, man community manager, developer relations, and documentation writer at Amazee.io. I've been there about three years now. You can find me on Drupal.org, Twitter, Mastodon, and the Drupal Slack. Um, also, I before I get into it, um, I if you have any feedback on this talk, I would love it if you reach out to me, whether it's good feedback, constructive feedback, whatever, because I'm giving this talk at a really big conference next <laughs> month, and I'm a little nervous about it for the first time. So whatever you got, send it my way. So we're going to talk about documentation today. Um, I've divided it into a handful of parts. We're going to talk about what documentation is, why it's important, what makes good docs, what makes bad docs, um, what leads to documentation failure, what the consequences of bad docs are, and then we're going to talk about how to change your culture and a couple ideas for what to do if none of that works. So what is documentation? There are a lot of various definitions of documentation. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we're mostly going to be talking about tech documentation, software documentation. Um, what I focus on mostly at Amazee.io is our user-facing documentation. So the documentation that people need to actually use your product or service. So what does documentation do? It does a lot of things. This is just um, a handful of things that documentation does. It guides your users, tells them how to actually use your product. It also explains the code, both when we're talking about um, inline documentation and code comments, and also your larger documentation. It paints a bigger picture of what everything does. Um, it also establishes all of your processes, you know, documenting everything that you do and why you do it and how to do it. Um, it helps you to onboard new customers. So when you've got new people, you can point them to the documentation and say, hey, this is how to onboard. This is how to get this done. Um, documentation can also be helpful for marketing. It shows your thought leadership, it shows your expertise, it shows how serious you are about the subject, um, how serious you are about your product and the things that you do and the things that you sell. So why is good documentation so important? Like we just said, better onboarding is one of the reasons. If you don't have any documentation, if you don't have anything that says, hey, if you're a new customer, go to this page and start here. If you don't have a starting guide, a beginner's guide, people don't have any idea what to do. It helps with faster troubleshooting, both for your users and for your support team. It helps to retain users and customers. You know, if you're using a product and you can't figure out how to use it or how it's supposed to work, you're not going to stick with that product or service. It improves productivity. Um, both among developers who develop your product, the support team who supports your product, the sales team that sells your product, and the users who use it on their end. It also, along with that, it saves time. If you don't have to go and dig up and figure out and translate all of the, you know, engineer speak into user speak for people, you're saving time. You're also avoiding miscommunication. If everything that you need to know is written down, then there's no need for, you know, sort of playing whisper down the lane and saying, oh, well, Bob told me this is how to do it, and Janet told Bob this was how they did it, and so this is how we do it now. Instead, you look at the documentation and say, this is how we do it. It also helps you to manage changes. So when you're changing something, maybe Janet doesn't know that Bob changed a thing. Well, if Bob updated all the documentation, then Janet would know and it wouldn't be a problem. So why are good docs important? Um, these statistics are from a study with Cornell University. 61% of professionals and distributed teams say it can be hard to figure out what their colleagues are working on. Um, I know that that is definitely a thing that I have dealt with working on a remote team. A lot of my team is in Australia and New Zealand. So if they're not updating documentation, if they're not constantly letting everyone else know what they're doing, I don't always know what they're doing. 44% say siloed digital tools make it hard to spot if work is being duplicated. So if your documentation is going on in multiple different places, then people aren't going to know where to go for the canonical version of the information that they need. And 62% report missing opportunities to collaborate and achieve better results. So again, if you don't know what other people are working on, it's hard to work together, and working together generally makes things better. 
So one of the reasons that we need documentation is that humans are terrible at data storage. We have great brains, but they're not very well organized. So what makes for good documentation? Good documentation is easy to understand. It's written in straightforward, simple language. It gets to the point. We don't need to be writing essays. This isn't where you show off your college level writing um, abilities. You explain what people need to know and nothing more. It also has good visuals. People don't like to read things that are visually unappealing, that are visually difficult to read. Good documentation is also vetted for accuracy. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense if someone is writing all the documentation and no one is ever checking to make sure that it's correct. For example, I am the documentation writer on our team, but I'm not one of the engineers. So I rely on the engineers to tell me, yes, this documentation that you've written is correct. Um, good documentation also tends to include the author and date so that you know, one, when this is updated. And if something needs to be changed or there's a concern, you can contact the author and let them know that something needs to change. It also addresses the right audience. So, you know, say you have a product that um, people in a variety of positions and audiences might use. Make sure that your documentation is targeted to the right person. You don't want to be trying to, you know, sell to the business people of the company in your documentation if that's not, you know, the purpose of your product. If your product is for software developers, then your documentation needs to be targeted towards software developers. So on the other hand, what makes for bad documentation? And of course, these are just examples. One major thing is documentation that is fragmented across platforms. This is a huge one that so many organizations deal with. They've got some documentation over here, they've got some public documentation, they've got some private documentation. We've got a handbook, we've got a confluence, we've got a wiki, we've got a GitHub, we've got a GitLab. And all of that means that your information isn't in one place and it isn't easy to find. Incomplete docs are also very bad docs. Whatever you write in your documentation, even if it's not fully fleshed out, the pieces that you publish must be complete. And if that means you're giving the minimum viable documentation for someone to get started, then do that. But it's better to have the minimum viable documentation than to have a whole bunch of incomplete documentation. Out of date docs are also bad docs. Um, I know probably everyone in this room has run into a situation where you're trying to work with a piece of software and you get down to like step 17 and something is different and you can't fix it and you can't figure it out because step 17, something changed and no one ever updated it. Bad docs also make assumptions. They make assumptions about the knowledge of their user. They make assumptions about the things that their users might know. Good documentation doesn't make any assumptions. It assumes that everything that you need to know is on the page. Bad documentation also uses jargon. Um, software is a global industry. We work with people from all over the world every day. Americans love our jargon. We love our sports slogans. We love, you know, saying he hit it out of the park. Or he hit a home run. Um, people from other countries don't have any idea what on earth you are talking about. <laughs> so avoid using jargon and slang in your documentation. And again, if it's not tailored to the right audience, it's bad documentation. You need to make sure that you are talking to the right person. So what leads to this documentation failure? Um, documentation is often everybody's problem and nobody's job. Uh, people on the team often don't have time for documentation. You know, engineers get booked out for their 40 hours a week and there is no time for them to write. There's also often no incentive. You know, if you're the person who's developing the product, you don't need the documentation as much as the users. Well, it sucks to be a user, doesn't it? <laughs> so we need to create an incentive for people to write documentation. But also a lot of developers and engineers have no experience writing documentation. They don't write, you know, pros, they write software. Um, so this is where things like training come in. Also, sometimes there's a lot of red tape. You know, if you're coming into an organization where all of your documentation is fragmented and it's all over the place, it's going to take some buy-in from various people, you know? There's the people who love Confluence, they don't ever want anything to be anywhere but Confluence. It's the people who spent a week making this whole wiki, and they're like, no, our wiki is the best. So, you know, you can have red tape where it, 
creates you from being able to make effective documentation. There's also issues with information hoarding. If you've ever worked at a company that has like a legacy product, and you've got that guy who sits in the basement, and he knows how everything works, but he doesn't want to tell anybody how anything works, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> it's also, um, you know, documentation can be hard to keep up to date. I'm the only, you know, official documentation writer at Amazee.io, and, you know, I sometimes struggle to know what exactly has been changed, when was it changed, and what is the change of the documentation that I need to make to reflect that. There are also often just a lot of excuses. You know, the code is self-documenting. That's great. Users don't go and look at the code of your software to figure out how to use it. Again, it's too hard to keep up to date. That can be a really valid reason. And again, it adds too much time to my development. So what are the consequences of these bad docs? Um, this is a case study. It's a, it's a little old. It's from 2014. but. 48% um, of Google engineers cited bad docs as their number one productivity issue. 50% um, of their site reliability engineers cited problems with their documentation. And docs were considered everybody's problem, but nobody's job. So what worked for them was to make their documentation radically simpler for their engineers. Um, they developed a system called G3 Docs which did the following. It removed decisions. It was the only way that they were allowed to document things. That's it. Use this system. That's the documentation. They also hosted their docs next to their source code in Markdown so that their engineers could stay in their IDE. Um, their documentation got automatically rendered into pretty HTML pages, um, and no one had to do anything. It was all set up so that when they committed it and pushed it, everything just worked. They also formed alliances with the engineers to introduce all of this tooling. They partnered with specific teams so that they could strategically make sure that they were integrating everything that they needed to integrate. Um, they released and iterated all of their documentation in the open, um, and they didn't force any teams into this new workflow. They led by examples, and when other teams were like, oh, wow, that looks really great, then they signed on. So some of the consequences of bad documentation um, having to redo work because requirements weren't clear. Um, so, you know, maybe you went through all of this setup and you were trying to install something, and then it turns out that that wasn't even the right version. You have to go back and you have to uninstall it and reinstall it. Missing information on areas of a code base. So maybe you're a new developer who's coming on and you're like, oh, hey, what does all this code do? Um, and it's not documented and you don't know. And of course, if your docs are hard to find, they're going to waste time. Again, the fragmentation issue. Bad docs are worse than no docs. It's better to let people figure things out on their own than give them the wrong information. So, how do we change your culture? First of all, know that culture is not immutable. Culture can be changed. Even if you think it can, can't, it can. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different topics under changing your culture. Um, the first one is to start from the top. And this isn't just about buy-in, but establishing that clear, concise writing is the expectation from everyone on the team. And make sure that your higher-ups and stakeholders are leading by example with quality writing. You know, if you have a CEO who always sends out missives that are, you know, full of typos and bad grammar, that's gonna set the stage for what people think is expected of them. So make sure that the people in your company that people look up to and derive their expectations from, make sure that those people are producing quality writing in everything that they do. Choose someone to drive it. So whether you have someone full-time who's a documentation writer, um, or you've just chosen someone who has taken interest in it, or someone who has time on their um, in their schedule, make some one person responsible for managing the documentation. This person is also responsible for creating things like templates, trainings, and any other support materials that are needed to create documentation. Make it easy. Like Google did, choose tools that integrate into existing workflows. 
Let developers and engineers stay inside their code editor. Don't make them go somewhere else to update the docs while they're doing their daily work. Use a version control system like Git. Git can do an amazing amount of things on the back end so that you don't have to be, you know, you set it up once and you don't have to worry about it again. And also ensure everyone has access. Um, make sure that absolutely everyone on your team has access to edit and develop your documentation so that there's no excuses not to. Here's another case study, which even if it weren't out of date, would probably be out of date in a day anyway because it's about Twitter. But this is about Twitter in 2014. Back in 2014, Twitter had three technical doc writers. That's it, in the whole company. Um, so they started to encourage documentation via both education and what they called doc days, which were kind of these like hack days that they would have where everybody on a team would sit down and write documentation. Um, much like Google did, they also built a new docs as code stack, which they called DocBird at the time. They created a ton of documentation templates. Um, and, um, you know, they pretty much just made everything standardized so that everyone was using the same thing, their documentation wasn't fragmented, and everyone had the responsibility of being a technical writer. Um, DocBird was a customized wrapper for Sphinx, so if you've ever used MakeDocs, that um, it's similar, it was also similar to the, the product that Google built called G3Docs, builds the documentation from source code automatically and removes the question of where do we put the docs. <coughs> Start with standardization. Establish a tool set. This is the tool set that everyone's going to use to update the docs. This is where the docs live. Create templates. Um, I have a handful of templates for our documentation that's just sort of these layouts that help people who are thinking, oh my god, how do I sit down and write documentation? How do I do this from scratch? I don't know how to do this. So if you can create guides and templates and trainings, you can help people to write better documentation. Also create a style guide. I have this big document that's our, I call our technical manual of style, where I talk about all of the things and how we're going to write them down, what we're going to capitalize, what we're not going to capitalize. I have a whole list of like, these are camel case, these aren't camel case, because I can never remember. Um, and I make sure that that reference is available for everyone. And have an approval process. It's no good having everyone submit to the docs if you don't have it established who's going to approve these, what is the process, who has to sign off on this. And then finally, you also want to establish a maintenance schedule. When do things get updated? Why are they updated? Who's updating? And who's responsible for what? Empower all of your contributors. Use a system that allows for contribution from everyone. So for example, we use Write the Docs and, um, or Read the Docs, Write the Docs is the community. <laughs> and this allows for all of our engineers to write their documentation in Markdown, but also if there are people on our team who aren't engineers who want to update it, who aren't as comfortable going into Markdown, because everything is hosted on Git, they can go in, edit that markdown page in Git, preview it, and submit it just like everyone else would. And give trainings on how to write the docs. I think a lot of people like me who are technical writers, we grew up writing, we always liked writing, we were always good at writing, and it doesn't always occur to us that like, you know, other people either aren't good at writing or they think more often, they think they're not good at writing and they think they're not good enough to write documentation. So giving people the confidence to know, hey, you can write documentation, your writing is fine. Or for example, there's a couple people on my team who are always worried about their typos and grammar. So I say, hey, write the documentation, send it my way, I'll edit it, I'll clean it up, we're collaborating, and now we have the docs. Make sure you create a positive feedback loop. If people are writing documentation and they're spending all this time on it and they're contributing to it, but they never hear a thank you or a great job or I'm so glad we got these docs updated, then it's kind of hard for them to have any sort of internal desire to continue working on this. And then allow everyone to have a sense of ownership over the docs. So make sure that, you know, whatever part of the code that people have ownership of, make sure that they're also feeling like they have the ownership of the documentation for the piece of code that they're writing. So, um, what if it doesn't work? 
these are just a few examples of things that you do if sort of none of this is getting people to write documentation. Um, don't accept merge requests that don't include the needed documentation updates. No, you know, this is a hot fix, this has to get pushed through, this is so important, I'll do the documentation next week. The documentation comes with the code. Um, last year I gave a talk called, um, uh, it's on another slide. Um, the building the business case for documentation, documentation is a deliverable. So I talked about how, you know, it's important to make sure that your documentation is accepted and um, required as a deliverable along with your actual code. Make doc writing an official part of everybody's job description. You know, if engineers know that they are required to write the documentation along with the code and it's not just an extra or the thing that Alana is always begging them to do, um, make sure that people know that they have to write it. This isn't just you know, something that we would like to happen. This isn't something that would be nice to happen. This is every bit as required as the code that you are committing. And then finally, make sure that people have a, a sense of intrinsic value about documentation. Make sure that they understand why it's important for them personally to write documentation. Not just because it's good, not just because it helps our users, not just because it helps the support team, but what is it for each individual person on the team that makes documentation important? As usual, I talked way too fast, and I got through this really fast. Um, but if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. I always love talking about documentation. Mike? So you mentioned Sphinx. Yeah. And a couple others, maybe. But do you have recommendations for tools, or tools that you like, or tools for different situations to help our documentation? Okay, so the question was if I have any um, recommendations for tools to help with documentation. I think it depends on your team. I really like anything with a markdown based approach. Um, I think it's really easy for people to understand. Um, I also like in my spare time, I, I do a lot of animal rescue and so I write documentation about animal rescues and I made, I made a whole website for our, our animal rescue with just basically like how to care for all of these animals. Um, and I've gotten people who are absolutely not tech minded at all to get into, just go into GitHub, hit the edit button, edit it and make it happen. <laughs> they don't know anything about programming. They probably don't remember that I said it was markdown, but they can do it. Um, so I think any system like that is really great because you know anyone in your organization can have the ability to update the documentation. Um, I think read the docs is great. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can use it. Um, Sphinx is the like the Python version, and it can get if you're trying to do fancy things. Um, Sphinx I think can help you help you get there. But most people just need a really straightforward just. Here's a page that gets generated. Here's the information. Um, so where, where would you start? Like, if, if the organization like never used a doc tool before. Like, where do you go to even see what's out there and what's available? Like, where, 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 where do you start? So the question is, um, if your team has never done documentation before, where do you start? Um, honestly, I think the Write the Docs, Read the Docs community is a really great place to go. Um, they. They have a, two annual conferences every year, they have a newsletter, they have meetups, they have all kinds of things. Um, they have a big Slack channel, um, sort of everything that you might want to know about documentation. Um, and it's really interesting because for me, like, when I think of documentation, I mostly think of tech, but there are people from you know, sort of all over various industries in that community um, talking about you know, how they use documentation, what different platforms they use. Um, another really great resource is Community Roundtable, which is sort of more um, like community manager focused, but they do have, they have a lot of resources and they um, have some good stuff about like different platforms that people use to manage things. Um, less on the, the developer documentation, but more about the customer facing documentation. I find the word documentation actually is off-putting to people, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions on how you get people to go to those guides and trust them without getting uh, intimidated by it. Okay, so the question was, um, sometimes the word documentation can be off-putting, and how do we kind of get around that? I, that's really interesting. I don't know that I've experienced that. Um, 
and I think you know there's a lot of different words if you find that you know people think that documentation is something big and scary you can always call it a user guide or a getting started guide and I also like to put things in my documentation like here's a getting started guide here's a user guide so they see it you know in the menu on the sidebar and it's not just you know a whole list of technical terms that they don't understand yet because they haven't been able to dive in um, so I think having like a really good straightforward you know, front page for your documentation that, you know, uh, if you need to sort of sort audiences out, like, this is for users and this is for developers, like, make sure that you're getting people where they need to go and you're not giving them something too intimidating. Um, another thing I like to put in documentation is, like, your basic stuff and your advanced stuff. Like, even if you could put it all on one page, let's just get the basics out of the way. Let's teach you all the basics. And then we'll let you know there's these other pages with advanced stuff if you've gotten the basics down. Because I think people see like really long forever scrolling pages of documentation and they scroll down and they're like, oh god, I'm never, never going to learn all of this. So if you can just kind of break it up, and I think that goes back to making things visually appealing. Um, breaking it up, whether that's with screenshots or images or just put it on some different pages, make sure everything's nicely formatted. I think that can help with the sort of intimidation level. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know, could you comment on um, where you see um, sort of the silos of documentation? You think about developers documenting their code, and then you have your users' guides, and then you have maybe, you know, company might have, you know, some, some guidelines that they're using. Um, and I'm just, as, a, as you're giving a presentation, I was trying to see how those might intermit, intermingle, and you know, um, how do you manage kind of like those different silos, and how do you sort of, if, if indeed they're siloed, and, and how do you kind of like, you know, have the, uh, the flow of information across those channels? So the question was about silo documentation and, and communication across different silos and channels. Um, I think one thing that really helps for me is that we're a very um, open source company, open source ethos drives everything that we do. So when we're writing documentation, we try and think like, is there any reason this can't be public? So if, if there's no reason that we can think of that information shouldn't be public, we make it public. So we've got, you know, our user facing documentation, we have a public facing handbook, like our, our company handbook is public. Um, so people, you know, they know who we are, they know what we're about, they know what it's like to work here. Um, so I think that kind of taking that open source approach can really help. Um, because then obviously there are things that we don't necessarily want people to know. You know, we have passwords, we have sales strategies, we have things like that. So that's the kind of thing that we keep in, you know, our internal documentation, our confluence. Um, but everything else, if it can be public, it's public. And so that's how we always make that decision. That's how we make that delineation. And also things like, you know, if there's, if there's no reason for it to be public, some of the stuff, like, we have, you know, our engineers have run books and playbooks and things that they're just, there's they're nothing that people who don't work here would ever need to know. Um, it would just be a weird, confusing, extra thing to have. So that's the other stuff that we keep internal. Yes, yes, absolutely. There we go. Thank you. Anybody? Unfortunately, I missed most of the presentation. I don't know if you covered the QA role, but where I am, we're thinking about listing a part time QA role, which will kind of fill in this documentation gap. Um, and I just wondered, like, we need to get everyone involved, you know, the developers and any product owners or something, but we're looking at that QA role being like the linchpin of the rest. Uh, so the question is about um, bringing in a QA person and having them um, sort of be the person for the documentation. Um, I, I think in other talks I've talked about documentation as QA and sort of um, writing documentation can sometimes sort of be the quality assurance process where, you know, you're, this, this happens a lot in, in my job where like, my boss will spend days getting a whole system to work and then he'll send me this whole long rambling Word doc and then I go through it step by step and I find out if all of that works. And once all of that works, then that's our documentation. So I do think that QA and documentation definitely have a place to sort of 
marry and, and live together there. Yeah, for, for both end user, I mean, they can't produce like, all the documentation probably, but um, for front end, documentation, feature documentation, and testing, of course, but, but then the user got calls, right? That seems reasonable. Yeah, it's also how I sort of QA our documentation and see if it's out of date is sometimes I'll go look at it and I'll try and follow all the steps on a page and if something is broken, then I know I have to go back to our developers and say, hey, uh, step 17, thing is broke, we gotta figure this out. Um, so yeah, those roles definitely, um, definitely coincide. Uh, this is more of a, your personal path kind of question, but how did you end up doing this? So how did I end up doing this? I was um, a Drupal developer for a long time, and I guess I've sort of always been the person on my team who takes the time to make the documentation. You know, users have a question. Instead of trying to explain it to them 10 times, I would just grab some screenshots, throw it together, and say, hey, this is how you do that. And I think at some point I realized, one, that I didn't want to be a back-end developer anymore, and two, that I had these sort of like softer skills that were really needed, and I wanted to do something with community stuff and documentation, um, and in terms of finding a job that just kind of worked out, that Amazee.io at the time was um, hiring for exactly that role. They had a big, they'd never had anyone in this role, but they had a big client who needed, they were getting like a, a whole bunch of custom work and they needed customized documentation for all of that. Mm -hmm. So I initially came on to do all of that documentation and um, then they, they kept me on permanently. I ask because in terms of like recruiting someone for this type of role, how to, how to find the right people. And maybe it is looking, at, looking for people who used to be developers who don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> the direction they go. Yeah, I think a lot of people who come into the sort of documentation, technical writing, developer relations, community management, I think a lot of us do tend to be sort of like ex-developers, which is great because then we have the, the knowledge and the background to do all this work, which would be a lot harder if you you know, hired a technical writer from like the medical field who's a great writer, but they don't have any idea what a Drupal is <laughs> or, you know, what Kubernetes is or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I do think that sort of like looking into people and also like, you know, see who's writing the documentation. Like who's writing the documentation on Drupal.org? Like who's working on those projects? Um, what are they doing? Like do they, maybe some people do want to go take a documentation job and they don't know that that's, you know, out there. So, um, like a Google perspective, who writes their user facing, like who, who within the organization is responsible for user facing guides? Do they have their own team for that? I would imagine that Google at this point has their own team for documentation, or at least their teams probably have documentation teams. Um, they do a lot of um, documentation stuff. There's, I forget what it's called, it's something that sort of came out of like Summer of Code, now there's some like doc stuff. Um, where there's like documentation projects that can get worked on and um, any organizations can like sort of submit to have people like help like they'll give you a technical writer um, that are like volunteers for this project and they'll help you like get your documentation up and running so they're definitely really invested in documentation at Google. I just thought that old case study was kind of interesting to see like how much has changed. Anything else we still have time? documentation for like, you, like content editors mostly is what I do, but um, do you recommend, I mean, I know you were saying you use um, GitHub or things like that, but we oftentimes have it on the Google website itself. Is that not, but I do find that a lot of users also get emails that are like, I don't know how to do this and it's in the documentation. So even though they're aware that it's there, is that is there a better recommendation for having site owners use the document? I don't know, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, there's always an issue with people not finding the documentation, no matter how public or clear you make it where the documentation is and we definitely have customers that ask the same questions over and over and I'm like we have doc like, 
docs.lagoon, like you know that it's there. It's probably in the channel description of your Slack channel. <laughs> and also there's this nice little search box in the corner where you can search things because I set it up that way. But, you know, I think you do the best you can. Also make it Googleable. Like we had some sort of like SEO problems when we switched documentation platforms and people were Googling for the documentation because they were just used to using Google. Um, and they weren't finding the new documentation. So I think that's another thing is like sort of being aware of your SEO around your documentation and making sure that if someone searches like your product or whatever plus documentation that you're at least getting in the top few results there because otherwise people are just gonna get lost and tell you they don't know how to do it. It kind of has a good point that you know we're supposed to write documentation but also get the users being willing to actually read the documentation. And it's getting over the fact that you're going to spend all that time documenting something that somebody just could probably call you up about anyway. Yes. You know, it's really frustrating. Yes, I've learned to not take it personally when people tell me they, or if they say like, I don't think this documentation is good, and I'm like, why? What's what's wrong? And they're like, well, it was it was difficult. And I'm like, well, did you have problems with the steps, or is it just that the the task that you're trying to do is is difficult? Like, did you do everything? And then sometimes they come back and they're like, well, yeah, no, I guess there's nothing wrong with it. I just this is just hard. Right. Like, well, it is hard. <laughs> we do a lot of really complicated stuff. So. Do you think that documentation? Should be left for users to see feedback on or uh, comment on your documentation for other people to see? Um, do I think the documentation should um, allow for users to comment? Um, I think that can depend on what you would do with that feedback. Like we used to have a platform that had you could put like I think it was like a smile or a neutral or a frown on the documentation. And I thought this was so cool. I thought like people were going to tell us how our documentation was. And they were going to get all this feedback. Literally no one ever used it. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of a your mileage may vary kind of thing. Like if you think you have a user base that can give you that kind of feedback in that kind of platform, go for it. Otherwise, we've just discovered that we're happy with GitHub. You know, most of our users are, if not all of our users, are competent at Git. And they know, you know, we have a link to the repo and they can file an issue or a pull request or whatever. So that's how we make sure that everyone has access to our documentation. Yeah, I know that, um, I'm not sure if Drupal has the same thing, but on WordPress they have in their documentation, you, anyone can comment. So people have said, I was trying to do this thing and this is how I figured it out. And so at least for code, I found that really helpful. If like you don't understand the function being described, but you see how lots of people used it successfully, so. Yeah, I think there can also be a downside to having public comments, because like think about like Stack Overflow, like you don't know that that first answer is right. Like you're just assuming that guy knows what he's talking about. So I don't, like you might not want to get into a situation where people are depending on other users' information. So I think that can be, you know, I think it depends on what you're documenting, what your community is like, you know, what your expectations are from the community. I think we had another question. For uh, like the site editors, couldn't you put that in the descriptions? Um, putting stuff in descriptions for site editors, yeah, I think the editor experience is really important and making sure that there's anything, you know, if there's stuff that they need to know, documenting it. Like when I was a developer, I was the person who always write, wrote like super long descriptions of every field and made sure you knew what the limitations of the field were, what you were expected to put in the field. Um, so I think that's really important. But if you have sort of like a larger documentation that wouldn't make sense to just plop it in there, then that's when we have like separate documentation pages. You guys have awesome questions. Documentation is a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Any, oh, it's telling me we should. Right. Any, anybody else? One thing that we struggle with is we don't include a lot of screenshots in there because we know it's six months from now we're going to change the back end interface, right? And we don't want to have to go in and replace all of those screenshots. Do you have any suggestions on how to manage that kind of update that you know is coming? Yeah, managing screenshots is basically the worst. Um, I try to avoid screenshots where possible because they're also not accessible. So if you can't describe in text what's in the screenshot, then you haven't done a very good job. So I use them minimally, um, or I use them supplementally. So it's like, here, I've described everything that you're doing, but just to break up this text, I'm gonna put in a screenshot. So those just kind of like aren't as essential, and people are still gonna get the gist if they're a little bit out of date. Um, but I do try, like I have an internal list of like where screenshots are, so I know that when we're changing our UI, I need to go and update this, this, and this, or like, 
we have a, a whole page about like doing some setups in GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket. Um, so every now and then I go and I run through those steps myself to make sure that they haven't changed those buttons, changed those options. Because that's happened a couple times where there was like an extra option and customers were like, what do we do? I don't know if I should check this box. And I was like, whoa, I don't know about that box. Let me find out. One more. Um, about using images to break up the text? What do you use then if you're not using screenshots? Oh, so if I'm not using screenshots, what kind of images do I use to break up the text? Um, honestly, sometimes I just throw some GIFs in there and just kind of like <laughs> mix it up a little bit. Make it, you know, documentation doesn't have to be sad and, and, and serious all the time. <laughs> um, so we definitely have a couple pages where I just threw a GIF in there because I was like, oh, this page looks boring. <laughs> I mean, don't go crazy with that. But um, And then also, it depends on the culture of your company. The, the culture of our company is that it's cool to put gifts in the documentation. Um, yeah, this is mostly for, the majority is for like university websites, so probably not the kids. Yeah, know. and again, screenshots aren't bad as long as they're supplemental to the information that you're you're relaying. So I think there are plenty of times where like a whole page of screenshots is great as long as people can understand it without the screenshot. Yeah, we'll be updating her documentation with the D10 upgrade of the UCK editor. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for all the screenshots. <laughs> yeah, it has to be done though. <laughs> Thank you. Building on that, annotated screenshots, right? You mark up your boxes and stuff. What's your perspective on those versus the words versus the image? Uh, annotated screenshots. I mean, I, I do tend to annotate the screenshots that I that I make, um, especially if you're you know you're screenshotting a whole thing and you just want to show someone where the you know where this one thing is. Um, but again, making sure that I describe those, that there's an image description, and that whatever text is on the page is also saying there's a button in the upper right corner. It's purple. It says this. Click that button. Do you do any sorry, any video tutorials? Or? Do I do any video tutorials? Um, not. So much. We have. Um, I did like a short series of video tutorials for our documentation to kind of see. Some people like videos. Some people like text. I'm like a text person. I don't like watching a 20 minute video to figure out how to do something that only takes 30 seconds. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've talked about doing videos. We do like larger demo videos. But for the most part, I think that our user base seems to agree with me in terms of videos aren't really our thing. We would rather just search for the text, get to the text. So I think that's a lot of like knowing your audience. You know, I think there's a lot of beginners who really like watching videos. Someone walks them through the whole thing. You know, they know exactly what to do. But videos are also really hard to keep up with. You know, you can't, you can't just edit a video and update it super simply. Um, I use Camtasia to do a lot of my videos. So even though it's all like broken up and spaced out and really nice, um, it still takes me hours if I have to go in and like switch out screenshots or I'm like, cutting something off right at this frame so that I can record it at this frame. And uh, I wind up doing that with our demo videos sometimes, but I don't care as much if they're perfect because they're just demos and they're not, you know, I'm not expecting someone to rely on them. So I think just be, um, be careful when you're using videos and make sure that um, all of your information is available somewhere else too. Anything else? Also, if you ever just want to like reach out to me on Twitter and talk about documentation, I really, I really like documentation. <laughs> I write wikis for fun. So, all right, thank you guys, and I will put this up on the um, on the camp website. I also have all the references here and the links to the other talks on documentation that I've given.